Greetings, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to be here. My name is Jennifer Carinci, and I am the Program Director for STEM Education Research here at the, Associate, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Principal Investigator of our NSF-funded IUS Award, the AAAS IUS Initiative. Today, we are featuring a very special workshop led by Dr. Courtney Nye, Dr. Sarah Wise, and Dr. Joelle Corbo titled, Utilizing a Principles Focused Approach for Change Efforts. We look forward to kicking off the workshop in just a moment. First, I have a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded. However, breakout rooms are not recorded. Closed captioning is also available and you can download and view the full transcript by clicking the CC button. Also, be sure to share your thoughts and ideas with the greater IUS community by tweeting along with hashtag IUSeInsights. You can follow us on Twitter at IUSeProgram and on LinkedIn. The recording and slides for today's session will appear in the coming days next to our archive sessions on the Summer Labs page. Next week, we look forward to seeing everyone on June 22nd for developing a new faculty model to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. The event begins with a keynote from Dr. David Asai from the Howard Hughes Medical Institution and then transitions to concurrent sessions led by Dr. Christine Grant, Dr. Don Terry Stallings, and Dr. Zakia Wilson Kennedy. These conversations include examining equity within faculty recruitment, tenure systems, creating cultural change in STEM, confronting common faculty challenges at minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities, and more. So please join and help us foster dialogue around these issues on June 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern. Now, I'd like to bring our attention back to today's workshop to learn about sustaining change efforts in undergraduate STEM and leveraging a department action team model to do so. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. So I've put the link to today's slides as a PDF into the chat. Um, in case you'd like to follow along in your own way. Uh, I wanted to say good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today to talk about using a principles-focused approach for change efforts, and specifically the departmental action team model. We're really happy to be able to present to our IU's peers. We'll be spending some time on ways to implement the DAP model, but we know many of you already have active projects. We also know a number of recent projects that are pulling elements of the DAT model. So regardless of your interest in coming here, we hope we'll touch on something that's relevant to everyone. By way of introduction, Courtney, Joelle, and myself have been involved in the DAT project for four to seven years each, and we've all facilitated DATs and conducted research on the model. Courtney is a chemist by training, by the way. I'm a biologist, and Joelle is a physicist. So by this end of this webinar, we hope you will gain knowledge of the basic components of the DAP model, understanding how the DAP model is implemented, as well as ways it can be adapted to local contexts. Uh, we hope you will have the ability to evaluate if the DAP model is an appropriate change effort for catalyzing the kinds of changes you're interested in. And we also hope that you will walk away knowing how to access our available DAT resources and how they can be used to support change in departmental contexts. And this is an outline of the events for this webinar after um, an overview by Joel. Uh, he will lead us through some uh, thinking about culture in departmental change and an activity with that. And then Courtney will talk to us about the core principles and we'll do a breakout rooms activity around that. Um, then I'll tell you a little bit about implementing the DAT model more specifically and finally wrap up with some um, DAT stories that illustrate impacts on um, departmental culture and um, also curriculum. And we are reserving about 10 minutes of time for Q&A. So just some notes on participation today. If you have questions, please use the chat to add them as they arise. 
we will try to answer some um, within the chat and we'll take some verbally. And um, we'll be posting links to all of the activities and other references in the chat as well. So now I'm going to hand it over to Joelle to give you an overview about the DAT model. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, and thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us today. Um, looks like a, a pretty big group, which is which is exciting. Um, OK, so yeah, I'll uh, give sort of the, the lightning overview um, uh, of the DAT model. And as Sarah said, you know, there are certainly um, details that we're going to end up leaving out. So please um, post your, your questions in the chat. And we'll also have information to how to get in contact with us afterwards. Um, so uh, big picture, what is a DAT? Um, so DAT stands for Departmental Action Team. Uh, and a DAT is a departmentally based um, working group of somewhere between six to eight-ish um, faculty members, staff, and uh, students um, from a single department uh, with two main goals, um, uh, or the, that's formed with two main goals in mind. One is to create change around some uh, issue involving undergraduate education, some broad scale issue um, with a real focus on uh, structural and cultural change. And I'll, we'll get to a little bit later, like what does what does broad scale undergraduate education issue actually mean? Um, the other the other important goal uh, is to help that participants learn how to become better change agents through developing all sorts of skills around facilitation, leadership um, and so on. So you can really think of this as, you know, Goal one is about creating change, and goal two is about becoming better at making change in the future so that once the DAT ends, um, the work, that kind of work can continue, can continue into the future uh, without us. Uh, and so DATs were developed uh, at CU Boulder in 2014, um, and we currently have an NSF project that's been funded uh, since 2016 and has extended our work to Colorado State University. Uh, so two institutions where we've run, we've run DATS. Um, so what do, what do these groups look like? As I said, membership of about six to eight people, all from a single department. And we really try to strive for diversity and roles in these groups. So when we say faculty members, we're really thinking of non-tenure track and tenure track faculty members, tenured and untenured, um, undergraduate students and graduate students and staff members. Basically, who are, you know, alumni perhaps, um, essentially anybody who sort of has skin in the game when it comes to undergraduate education for that department. Um, we also, you know, ideally want there to be uh, a good diversity in demographics and other sorts of um, perspectives um, in the group as well. Although, as as you might imagine, in some STEM departments, that's you know that's constrained by by who's already uh, in the room. Um, the groups typically meet uh, every other week for about 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, we like to, to start with a sort of commitment from the department of, of running one of these for, for a year, for an academic year. Um, most of the time we end, up, we end up going for up to four semesters just because the groups are um, excited to keep going. Um, uh, facilitation. So we really see facilitation as really important um, to to DATS uh, and and really to to any complex change effort. Um, the way we we've run them to this point is that you know as Sarah pointed out, she and Courtney and I and numerous other people have have facilitated DATS, uh, and we're external to the depart to these to the departments we're working with. Um, uh, and sort of our, our main focus is really on um, supporting the team in, in developing sort of functional practices and really on process um, um, much more than, than content. Um, the area of focus for each group varies. Different DATs do different things, um, but they're all related to undergraduate education and we want them to be chosen or at least refined by the participants themselves through some sort of visioning process that we support them through. In other words, we don't want an externally imposed mandate because that's a really good way to kill motivation. Um, and in terms of the group's relationship to the department, we certainly want support of the chair and maybe other sort of um, you know, leaders in the department, regular communication with the rest of the department to cultivate allies and positive feelings and generate support. 
And so this is a, a diagram, I won't go through all the details, but um, that essentially uh, steps through the sort of life cycle of a DAT. Um, so you could think of this as the steps along the way uh, to, to creating change. Um, this is a model, so it's, it looks linear, but of course reality is not so nice and neat and tidy. Uh, in practice, groups sort of jump between steps and so on. But basically the idea is, you know, once you have your, your, your team set up, we first focus on developing a shared vision. So this is sort of where are we going uh, as a group um, uh, and coming to, uh, to consensus on goals. Then we, we make sure that the group thinks a lot about what is the current state of the department. So this is sort of where are we now? Um, because without knowing both where we're trying to go and where are we now, it's really unlikely that any sort of change process is gonna succeed. Um, and then steps sort of five, six, seven, all of that is about actually figuring out the work, carrying it out and assessing the results. Uh, and then deciding what's next is essentially step eight. We have a pretty well uh, developed <laughs> theory of change uh, for, for how DATs work. And that is way more than can be put in one slide. Um, we have a paper cited down at the bottom of this slide that, that goes into the detail. But essentially our theory of change has four stages sort of before the DAT forms, during the DAT and after the DAT. Um, uh, of course, before the DAT is formed, the outcome that we want is for a DAT to form. Um, by the end of running a DAT, we hope to achieve the four outcomes under that number two uh, heading. So the department valuing the DAT's work, the DAT having actually affected change related to undergraduate education, the DAT members like actually being change agents and the DAT members being able to enact DAT culture. And we'll get to what we mean by culture in a bit without external support. And ultimately the ultimate goal of the whole thing is this long-term outcome down at the bottom of the slide, which is that the department is supported by its members in making sustainable, positive, iterative changes that are aligned with our core principles, which we'll also talk about in a little bit. Um, that's the ultimate goal here, is that we have a department that functions in a way that change is just this natural part of its process. Okay, so that's, like I said, lightning overview. Um, there's more pieces that will that will filter in through the rest of, of, the, uh, of the presentation. But for now, I want to shift this a little bit into thinking about um, culture and, and sort of how culture is, is defined. Um, in particular, because this is a word that, you know, can be kind of slippery. Uh, it, it can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. And so I think, you know, we think it's helpful to be very clear about the way we think about what culture means. Um, and so we really draw a lot from um, the organizational change literature, in particular Shine, um, who defines like several layers of culture. Um, and so one way to think about that is that there's this sort of top layer, which is the kind of visible artifacts in an organization. So things like meeting structures, physical spaces, um, how celebrations, what is celebrated and how, policies, rules, all the kinds of stuff that like lies on the surface. So if you were some sort of outsider walking into an organization, these are the things you'd pick up on, you know, pretty, pretty readily. Um, but there's at least one deeper layer of culture and actually probably more than one, which is the sort of invisible values and beliefs and assumptions that drive the visible layer. Um, so these might be beliefs about like, our priority here is doing good research or only tenure track faculty should make, should be able to make decisions um, or the assumption that students just know who and when, who to ask for help from and when to ask for help, right? And so these kinds of beliefs and values then end up driving the, the visible layer. So then how, how do we set up our space? What are our policies and rules? And so we wanted to do uh, an activity um, to help you all think a little bit about what are some of the attributes of departmental culture particularly that could impact the student experience. And for you, if you're in a department, you might wanna think of your own department. If you're in some different position within the institution, you know, th think about either some department you've experienced in the past or some sort of generic department. Um, 
So we'll take a few minutes just for folks to reflect on this question um, based on your own experiences and observations, knowledge from the literature, et cetera. And then what we'd like you to do is jump into this Padlet um, uh, that's linked here um, to start sort of adding your thoughts. But let's take a minute or two first to, to, to think. Keep, keep typing, everyone, <laughs> um, if, if you still have things to, to type in. But definitely I am, you know, I love that I'm seeing a really big variety of, of ideas and different sort of um, facets. You know, so there are some, some pieces here that are um, like assumptions about students. Uh, so I'm seeing students fail because they're unprepared or don't work hard enough. Or, you know, the idea that student culture is what it is and we shouldn't, you know, meddle with it. Some sort of non-interference principle. Um, uh, but then also, you know, there's things about physical space, like I saw something here that was, you know, photos and posters on the walls, right? So the idea that there's messages being conveyed, even uh, if nobody is around, um, or I guess the person looking at the pictures is around, but nobody else has to be around in order for a message to be conveyed based on, you know, what's on what's on our walls, how is our physical space set up? Um, you know, ideas about reward structures, what is rewarded, how is it rewarded, various other policy issues. Um, yeah, this is, this is all great stuff. And I think one, one possible feeling that you might have from, you know, looking at, looking at like giant lists of things like this is just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> culture is such a big multifaceted uh, uh, issue. There are so many pieces here. How do we ever address them all? Um, and so, you know, you might get this, this sense of overwhelm or of like, you know, some sort of like the impossibility of, of addressing all of this. Um, but I think a different way to look at it is that, you know, culture is powerful and it is multifaceted, but a nice thing about that is that you don't have to tackle all the facets at once, right? And being able to think about what are all of the, all of the individual pieces can help you sort of pick a few to focus in on um, and think about, well, how might those impact, you know, for better or for worse, how can I leverage those or how can, how can I work around them to, to make the kinds of changes I'm interested in making? Um, uh, anyhow, yeah, this Padlet will, will stick around. So if you want to keep reading what other folks have to say and commenting and so on, you know, feel, feel free to do that. Um, but I think that's all from me, at least on this activity. Of course, as usual, if there's questions and so on, toss them into the chat. But otherwise, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Courtney. Thanks, Joelle, for leading us through that activity on culture. Um, and, and now we're going to shift to talking about our core principles, which are actually one of the ways that we have used to um, concretize culture and to help us wrap our brains around, you know, what is culture and the impact that it may be having on students and learning experiences in the department. Um, and so our core principles, um, are basically an externalization of our values. Um, and, you know, all work is really guided by values or what we find to be important, right? You know, in any types of work that we do, we tend to focus on what we, what we consider to be of most importance. Um, and often though, these values are implicit and we don't necessarily share what we think is important and why we are necessarily doing the work we're doing or why we're doing it the way that we're doing it. And so for this project, we felt that articulating the, the values that are guiding our project not only helped us to make sure that we were making decisions that aligned with our values, um, but also in turn articulating these values helped contribute to positive and sustained change. Um, and so our project principles were developed um, through, you know, 
an understanding of the research that exists on team functioning and organizational change, particularly in higher education. And so we looked to the literature to find out what are the best practices for making change happen and for sustaining positive change in higher education. Um, and we consider our principles to be both design principles in that they are guiding our project, uh, project decisions and what we do, as I mentioned, and how we're doing it, but then also as desired cultural characteristics relating back to the culture that Joelle was talking about earlier and that the culture and the practices of departmental action teams and ideally eventually the department are guided or reflect these core principles. Um, so we have six core principles um, thus far. This could change. But right now, um, the first one is that students are partners in the educational process. And this is really grounded in the notion that uh, students should be given agency in their own education and should be given responsibility and power and influence over the decisions that are made related to their education. Um, and so this is reflected in the DAP model in many ways. You know, one way is that we really do encourage departmental action teams to include at least one to two undergraduate students um, on the teams so that we can hear from the perspectives of students in that particular department. And we're not just assuming what their experience is like. Um, the second principle focuses on achieving collective positive outcomes. Uh, we have found for STEM departments in particular, we like to focus on you know, the problem that is to be solved. Um, and so this reminds us that in focusing on the desired outcome, there are many different pathways to get to that outcome. And we are all uh, having the collective positive outcome helps us you know, reorient and remind ourselves that we are working towards the same thing um, and not necessarily trying to just solve this one, this one problem, but we're working towards this bigger vision. Data collection, analysis, and interpretation inform decision-making. And so this is encouraging folks to move away from anecdotal decision-making and really to think about, you know, what types of data are relevant for the work that we're trying to do and, um, you know, thinking about how, does our, how do our own biases uh, influence how we're interpreting data and we encourage groups to think um, about these things uh, when we think about principle three. Um, principle four focuses on collaboration among group members is enjoyable, productive, and rewarding. And this might just seem obvious, right? And but we have found that without paying attention to this specifically, um, sometimes it can lapse. And sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily create a group environment that is enjoyable and productive. And by paying attention to this particular principle, we often do this with like three or four minutes at the beginning of every meeting where we, you know, engage in conversations that are not necessarily related to the work. Um, and we have found that just cultivating, like intentionally cultivating this environment encourages DAP members to come back um, and really helps folks to engage in the team efforts. Um, the fifth principle is related to continuous improvement and thinking about how change is iterative and not necessarily one and done sort of solutions. Um, we like to think that, you know, although the departmental action team or any other change effort may be putting in a change that is suited for the context at that time, it might not always be the best solution or the best way to move forward um, and to work with students. And so, you know, we like to support departmental action teams in thinking about, well, how can we revisit this and how do we know that what we're doing is still working a year down the road or five years down the road? And like, what, what are the sort of mechanisms we can put in place to think about that and evaluate it? Um, and finally, um, the last principle is that work is grounded in a commitment to equity, inclusion, and social justice. And we have started to really think about this principle as being a principle we enact all of the time with in conjunction with all of the other principles. Um, and we consider this principle to really be influencing everything that we do all of the time. So like when we're enacting principle one, students are partners, are we doing it in a way that is truly inclusive and equitable, right? And so thinking about principle six um, and how that influences all of the work. Um, and so, you know, the core principles for us are something that we think about all of the time, as I mentioned, as we're developing the project and as we're working with departmental action teams on their change efforts. Um, and because this for us has been so reflexive um, in conjunction with the theory of change, this is one of, one of what we consider to be the foundational components of the departmental action team project. 
we recognize that we do this all of the time. We think about the core principles all of the time and think about how they're influencing what we're doing. And we wanted to give you all an opportunity to do that today as well um, and to support you in, in practicing thinking about principles and how they might apply to your own context. So today we're going to ask you to imagine a department that is becoming more aligned with one principle. So we're going to assign you to one principle um, and we will break you out into breakout rooms. And as a group, consider what would this principle look or sound like in a department? So in an ideal department, for example, that is embodying students or partners in the educational process, what does that look like? What are the behaviors, practices, policies um, of a department that is embodying that particular principle? Um, and second, we would like you to think about, well, how does this impact students, right? So how does, you know, in a, a department that is embodying a principle, how does that translate to the student experience? And how does this, how might this change what students are experiencing in terms of their, their learning and their education and their overall experience with your program? Uh, so I just want to uh, thank you all for participating in that activity. I had the pleasure to jump in a couple of different groups to hear some of the conversations that were going on. And um, just looking through the slides, it looks like folks were able to come up with a whole number of really, really great examples of what embodying these principles looks like and how that will in turn impact the student experience. And I would like to invite folks now to share not necessarily, you know, the examples that you came up with, but perhaps, you know, a reflection or two on how it was to think about the principles. Let's get like a little meta here. And how was it to think about the principles in relation to your own departmental um, context? And like, what was that process like? Um, and, and what was the process like for connecting it then to the student experience? Was this challenging or easy? Was it insightful? Was it just completely didn't seem useful for you at all? So um, if you would like to um, raise your hand or unmute yourself, I think we're, it's a good enough crowd where folks can be trusted to just, just unmute and share experiences. Um, so I'd just like to invite like a couple of folks to share if you are willing. I just want to, to make a, a brief comment that we spent a, a few seconds in our group talking about the language that we were using, uh, particularly yeah. that uh, we'd initially written down uh, about uh, failure is okay, uh, because we're talking about continuous improvement. But then when we yeah. got to the second question about students, uh, we started talking about, oh, is, is failure, uh, we may not want to use that word with students, that, that may have yeah. a really negative reaction and misunderstand and think that, you know, our uh, whatever things we're trying may have a negative impact on on them and their grades. Uh, so Definitely. we'll go backtrack and, and think about that a little bit more. Yes, that is a really good point, Kevin. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, thinking about the ways in which we're interpreting things versus how students may be interpreting um, a similar concept, and 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 then it's you know impact on us versus them and how that may be different as well. Um, thanks for sharing that. And we have mm -hmm. a comment from Stephanie. Yes, Stephanie. I just wanted to share out something that came up in our, our room. We were on the uh, principle four with the uh, collaboration um, essentially. And, and one of the things that I think resonated with a lot of us is that the students are, they notice when, when people in the department know each other we, and work together and, and we might not always appreciate that, but it could, it could definitely lead to good outcomes and their sense of belonging and their identity and connection to the department, which you know, we know has lots of great, uh, I mean, I'm repeating one of the people uh, in our room articulated it a little bit better, but that has a lot of downstream great effects for students, you know, um, outcomes in a number of different dimensions. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. If I see the department culture is warm and welcoming of each other, right, then then they're more well likely to experience that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Well, um, I'm going to take the next couple of sections on implementing the DAT model and DAT impacts. So in this section, we're going to talk about the resources we made available to support people who want to implement DATs or things like DATs. Um, we will talk about um, questions you have to answer to know whether starting a DAT is a good idea for a particular department. 
And we'll also look at approaches and resources to identify, train, and support facilitators. So here we're showing the two um, big places to find DAT resources. Um, our book, Facilitating Change in Higher Education, the Departmental Action Team Model, as well as um, the companion digital toolkit, which is free and can be used piecemeal by anyone. You can find the DAT digital toolkit at our website. I think, yep, thanks, Courtney. And it's not as much of a resource, but is a good way of communicating if you're working with people and they're trying to wrap their heads around DATs. Um, we've just come out with a four part blog series um, hosted by ASCN and and that's also on this slide so I find that that one is so each one is so short and it talks about a different stage of um, developing DATs and working them through their projects it can be a good orientation so this first question I brought up is the DAT model right for your context um, basically we need to make sure we know enough about departments and departments know are, are, are enough on the same page that when the decision to form a debt is made, it's one that's likely to be successful. And so um, these resources um, are some of the ways that you can um, start understanding whether it's the right thing for the context. The how-to guide that uses innovation con configuration maps um, is a lot like rubrics. There's different aspects of the DAT experience and facilitation and departmental aspects that are broken out in a rubric-like way. Um, the handout, the DAT core principles, is what we use when we go into meetings with chairs um, and also with DATs. And we want to get, the, get a bead on uh, what their thoughts are about the different core principles. Are there any that don't rub them the right way? Are there any that they're really excited about? And the theory of change is really helpful in that it can give you a sense of what is that roadmap that you would be trying to follow so that the DATs experience successful outcomes every step of the way. We wanted to show you next a snippet from our theory of change. This is the very like the very first section of it, where our starting point is that a de department needs change but lacks the capacity to enact it. And so these, what I was talking about with conversations with department chairs, um, getting on the same page, if that's done, then we can achieve this outcome one where facilitators, department members, and leadership have all communicated. Um, a second outcome that's important to be able to make progress towards initiating a DAT is that there has to be some sort of external support. That um, might mean uh, salaries for external facilitators or an agreement with a teaching and learning center to, to um, be lent a facilitator for a time. It could also be um, the development of an internal facilitator, maybe through some training experiences or getting them the book. We love our book. Um, and also, um, we always have provided snacks at DAT meetings. That happens to be a particularly important part of DAT culture. So those are just examples of external support. Here are a few more resources that can be used to communicate um, about DATs. There's a how-to guide that puts a number of our different resources together and can be used to build awareness of a DAT program perhaps on a campus. Um, there's the slides that you saw in the beginning from Joelle with the DAT model overview. And the collaborative communities handout is the one that I um, linked into the chat for Kevin with, with his really good question about the differences between FLCs and DATs. Here we see on the right uh, outcome, the next outcome of our theory of change that now some departments members should know enough to be ready to participate in a DAT. And in our book, 
at the end of every chapter, we have a list of indicators of success. And these can be helpful in identifying sort of go, no go points. We've talked about the, um, the success indicators over on the left, but it's also important on the right to be, um, you know, careful of red flags. So if there's an attitude towards undergraduate education as not important in a department, it's probably not quite the right time to start a dad. If the department is in the middle of a lot of turmoil, new chair, accreditation, campus um, initiatives that are mandated, then that's also probably not a great time. And when that happens, we have worked with DATS in trying to identify the kinds of learning experiences that might help the department move towards debt readiness. That could be getting involved in their teaching and learning center, um, attending conferences, taking um, just a small amount of data on their student experiences or analyzing some data on their student learning. So the next bit of implementation I wanted to talk about is about preparing facilitators. So as Joelle mentioned, facilitators are critical to the success of DATs. Um, and they're ready to run a DAT in our theory of change when they understand a particular department's needs and context. They have the capacity to support a DAT. They have the time. They have the um, skills. And they also have some legitimacy in the eyes of potential DAT members and the department leadership. Often legitimacy comes it is earned as well as DATs are formed, but it's good to start out with a good relationship. And some resources that are related to preparing facilitators come from our book in chapter two. There's a whole chapter on getting ready to facilitate. Um, possible facilitators can also take a skills inventory that um, allows you to see what areas you might want to build skill in. And we have a couple of how-to guides that help facilitators get a sense using a listening tour of the context of a DAT, or sorry, the context of a department, and, um, and that help facilitators sort of efficiently have all the structures they need to document and reflect well on meetings. And lastly, I wanted to show you part of our book. There's a whole bunch of segments called DATs in real life. So you guys can see that. They're the orange segments. And these are basically short stories of experiences that DAT facilitators and DAT, DATs have had in working through challenges together. Indicators of success here I've talked about a little bit already. So I wanted to mention a little bit more about internal and external facilitation and co-facilitation versus solo facilitation. We get lots of questions about these. Um, I talked a little bit about internal and external facilitators before in that they're both possible. We've had um, external facilitation work very well. Some of the advantages there is that the facilitators have a more independent outside perspective. And internal facilitators have done amazing work as well. We have trained some of our DAT members to take over the facilitation from us after we are done. We have also been recently working with groups that have um, been formed on campus and their internal facilitators would like some support. So we have like a like a monthly support chat group. And those folks are doing great. I mean, their, their groups are sticking together. They don't have the depth of preparation that DAT facilitators from the project do, but they're still doing really good work. So around co-facilitation versus solo facilitation, in our project, we've developed the co-facilitation model because it helps facilitators apprentice and grow, and it 
also provides multiple perspectives on what's going on in the group. Solo facilitation has also worked with with our with our like experienced facilitators. Sometimes we have had solo facilitators for a year, a year or more um, because of the resources that we had on hand at the time. And it's worked fine. Just needs to be a more experienced facilitator. Okay. So we are now in the my most personal favorite part of this webinar discussing the wide variety of impacts that dads have, dads have achieved um, and telling the stories of three dads that illustrate how they made impacts around equity and diversity and around shifting their educational programs. This chart um, lists all of the departments that have had DATS at CU and CSU and during the time of the project. And what, what, what to notice here are that there's a really wide variety of curricular changes that the DATS collectively have wrought, as well as a wide variety of cultural changes. And to just point out a couple more things about this chart, The, there are no lines going across the rows because they're not aligned. So astrophysics did not establish a new major. And we've done that because um, we need to maintain some anonymity for our DATs who are research subjects, our departments and our DATs. Um, also, you'll see that some departments have asterisks by them. And those are departments in which change continued to be catalyzed after external facilitation ended. So the DAT may have been in the middle of a project and they decided to internally facilitate to complete it. Um, some DATs have gone on to have multiple iterations of new projects. And, um, and some have set in place structures that allowed them to catalyze further change without necessarily having a working group, like structures in terms of job descriptions and policy. So now let's move to the, um, the DAT stories we have to tell. I think we're handing it over to Joelle. Yeah, I think I've got this one. Um, so one thing just to point out before we get into this, as, as Sarah said, you know, there is a research component to this project, of course, since it's an IU's, an IU's project. Um, and uh, so one of the ways that we protect uh, the anonymity of um, our departments, uh, since, you know, they are, we, we, uh, we want to be doing that for, for just as a sort of ethical research practice, is that we've given them all pseudonyms. Um, like potions. So I'll be uh, talking about the potions department. Um, uh, their focus uh, was to improve um, the experiences for underrepresented uh, undergraduates in their major. Um, you know, they were, uh, you know, one of these STEM departments that, um, that uh, in the discipline where, where, there's, where there's a lot of underrepresentation of students of color, people of color and women and so on. Um, so that was their main focus. Um, at least during the couple of years that they were formally a DAT, um, a total of four faculty members, a postdoc, uh, two staff members, three grad students, and two undergrads were on that group. Not all of those simultaneously. There was some sort of, you know, I think postdoc was only there for the first year, for example. So there was some, some moving around or, you know, comings and goings, um, but that was sort of the, the, the total set of people. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, uh, this group really focused on heavily early on was uh, the data collection and analysis piece. So trying to understand what, what is the situation for, for these um, underrepresented or marginalized sort of demographics of students, um, you know, where along the, the so-called pipeline, right, were, were, were people, um, uh, uh, essentially being lost, you know, where people just not enrolling at the university from, from these groups who were interested in, in studying potions or were, 
uh, were like the intro potions classes, the things that were the, that were uh, uh, sort of deterring people from continuing. Um, so they did that, uh, put some reports together for the department. Um, they also started a monthly seminar series on equity and inclusion topics to provide a space in the department where these sorts of issues could be discussed to sort of normalize that. Um, they uh, supported the department in shifting the introductory honors uh, course into, into rather than a sort of course, the sort of um, course that essentially students had to be invited into, which was a very weird process. Uh, instead, it turned into one where the students, uh, it was framed as a course for all majors. Um, they worked on getting gender neutral bathrooms in their buildings. Um, they put together a welcome event for, admi for admitted students from underrepresented groups. Uh, and one of the structural things that they ended up doing was getting themselves converted into a permanent standing committee of the department. So this group has continued um, over the last several years in that, in that way. Uh, and they ultimately ended up getting the President's Diversity Award from that particular university uh, a couple of years ago. And we just have a quote here from an interview with one of the faculty members in this group. Um, compared to a regular faculty committee, having both the undergrad and grad student perspectives about both their experiences and what they really care about has been really important for shaping what we do. And that's incredibly valuable. So, you know, just to, to, to see that this, this business of having this mix of, of people and especially having students as sort of equal members of these groups are, is, is, is really a valuable um, piece. All right, so let's move on to the next group. Yeah, so the next dat we would like to talk about uh, has been given the moniker, the divination dat, um, and their focus was really developing uh, programmatic learning outcomes for their undergraduate students. And the membership of this dat included two undergraduate students, one graduate student, three faculty members, two student advisors, and one staff member. And these these folks weren't necessarily all on the DAT at the exact same time. For example, there was one undergraduate student in the beginning and then a second one was added during the second year um, of meeting. And I think one of the faculty members rotated out and a different one rotated in. Um, the outcomes for this DAT were the development of departmental level student learning outcomes. They actually ended up revising them or developing them basically from scratch. And then aligning these learning outcomes um, with the majors courses, like the major courses in their program. And also the development of a department approved plan for collecting learning outcome data. And there are two principles that I'd like to highlight that really played a role uh, in, this, in this particular DAT. And the first is that students were really considered partners um, for this DAT and um, the undergraduate students and the graduate student both had very influential roles on the language that was used in the student learning outcomes, how they were assessed. Uh, and it was really, it was really awesome to see how the other, the non-student DAT members um, really elevated the student's perspective throughout this journey. Um, and they did this in, you know, ways not just within the team meetings, but also outside of that as well, when sharing, you know, the student learning outcomes that they were working on with the rest of the department, they actually actually explicitly emphasized that students played a role in developing these student student learning outcomes and that they were full team members um, and invited them to help present them as well to the department. Um, and so students were really perceived as full partners in this work. Um, and um, the other principle I'd like to focus on is the second principle, which is work focuses on achieving collective positive outcomes. And this um, principle really came into play uh, very early on with the stat where they participated in developing a shared vision of what an ideal student would look like graduating from their program in terms of skills and attitudes and perspectives. Um, and so they really, this DAT kept looking back to that shared vision that they developed at the very beginning when they were referencing, when they were developing student learning outcomes and thinking about, okay, well, how does this student learning outcome that we're writing about, how does that, ref how is that reflective of, you know, this, this vision we have of the students who are graduating from our, from our program. Um, and so they really kept attending to that shared vision. Um, and I just wanted to include a quote that came from one of the exit interviews with this dad, um, and that 
that faculty member said, providing these models for change, we probably never would have seen that had we not been a part of ADAPT. And talking through that was also really good because it allowed us to see how we function as a group and then department to make that change happen. It's also been good to have that space to ask someone who has that in their wheelhouse, just talking points or language, how to come up and draft that. And that's really reflecting um, also on principle five is thinking about continuous change. Um, and this group was very attentive to thinking about how their assessment of the student learning outcomes would influence their curriculum and their program down years down the line. And they were thinking about, well, how can we use um, this assessment plan to really inform the decisions that we're making later? And so using um, really thinking about the sustainability of their program based on the work that they were doing as part of this departmental action team. I think we can go on to the next app profile. Thanks, Gordy. So our last debt story is about one that we call runes. And this was one of our very early dads. And their vision was for their students to have a more coherent and meaningful experience as they proceeded through the, the courses in their major. So they were really looking to coordinate better. And they were made up of a tenure track faculty member and four lecturers, or you might call them instructors. So this one didn't actually have students on it. It was sort of in the early days before we made students as partners one of our central principles. And um, they really explored a lot of different mechanisms to get to this goal of coordination. Um, what they ended up with was to change the job descriptions of three instructors in the department in order to release them from one class that they would teach each year or each semester. I can't remember the, the frequency. But those course releases gave them the time to work on curriculum coordination and work in, with individual faculty on that and help them develop the curricular changes needed to coordinate. One of the outcomes of that was that they integrated case studies about um, the same topic across different levels of their major. So let's just pick malaria. It would come up in one way in an intro course and then in another way in a second sophomore division course. And then in a third way, it, the students would return to malaria um, to explore that in their senior capstone, for example. And the other thing that has happened with this was that there's been continuous support from these instructors across the faculty for other kinds of teaching developments. Um, in a way, they sort of have a, a miniature CTL in their department now. So here's a quote from one of the RUNES faculty members from an interview. Um, the facilitators didn't have an agenda. They were about helping us find our own path. And I think that was really important. That's a big takeaway I took from it, working with other faculty in our department. We have to be very careful not to push our own views or our own agenda on them. And obviously there is a purpose for these positions and we have to keep that in mind, but we also have to work with them to try and implement change. And what I like about that quote is it, it's speaking to that development of change agency in DAT members where the facilitator modeled something and the DAT member realized that that would be a useful way of approaching change in their future work. Um, looking at the principles that this, this DAT embodied, I think a lot of it um, also goes to principle two the work focusing on collective positive outcomes. So this was a, a DAT that was really integrated into the integrated into communicating with their department and figuring out the collective solution to get to this coherence that they were looking for. So to summarize this impacts section as well as the the webinar before we go to Q&A, there's three main areas in which DATs have these impacts. They can be driving department-wide curricular change. 
they can be catalyzing cultural and community change, and they can be developing the change agency of DAT members. And this third area, which is also what I was just talking about with runes, is an area of active research for us. We are looking back now that some DATs have been independently active for several years, and we're asking, are there threads between the things that DAT members learned or engage in and the sustained change that, that, are, that we can see occurring in these departments today? Um, sustainability is such an important challenge for IUs and other grant funded initiatives. And so we're hoping to get some really interesting insights into that sustainability of change um, question through this most recent research. If you are interested in some of the references that were at the bottom of our slides, they're all pulled together at the this last slide in the section. And um, I was alerted to the fact that the PDF we sent earlier is doesn't have the active links in it. And I think that's my fault. So we will be working to get one with active links out to you. If not during this Q&A, then um, with the follow up materials. And with that, I think we can turn to the Q&A. And um, there's a couple ways you could you could participate. You could use the raise hand feature as some people have done. Um, or you could put questions into the chat and then we'll take them from there. And um, I'll just leave this on our very last slide, which is about con contacting us while we do the Q&A. We would really love to hear from you if you're trying to implement a portion of the DAT model or DATs themselves. The way to get in contact with us is through this contact form. And of course, you can find us on the web in our emails and things like that. Um, and there's the website, Earl, once again, there at the bottom. So Courtney or Joelle, how are we doing on Q&A questions? I think we have responded to a lot of the Q&A questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if there are other folks who would like to ask different questions than what was in the chat, or we can revisit or expand on. Um, oh, Kevin actually just put a question in there. How does facilitation work on a day-to-day -day practical basis? What do they actually do if it can be generalized? And I will pass it on to one of you two to, to share that, and I will keep an eye on the chat. I can take it, Joelle. So over time, we created more structures to help us keep track of what we wanted to do as facilitators. And so there was sort of a rhythm. Um, uh, DAT meetings would occur monthly. So we would take care of the logistics of those, um, reminders about them, we'd help them schedule them in the first place. Um, we would make sure that the there was a um, agenda for the meeting. And we spent lots of time on the agendas to, to think through especially how to support equitable participation um, between all members of the DAT. And so we might start with a bunch of topics in our agenda, but then we would flesh out a whole nother level of how would those topics be broached? What would be the prompts? What activities might break the group into smaller groups so that you could harvest more ideas? Um, what kind of decision-making structures might the group like to use to, to tackle a decision that will help them make progress? So this agenda making was important and we usually did that in co-facilitator pairs. We would work together and review and you know, let it sit for a couple of days and then come back to it and finish it up. Um, during DAT meetings, we would be taking notes, um, very detailed notes, which would help us keep track of action items and ideas. Um, we might be collecting the ideas on sticky notes and then later summarizing them after a meeting. We would be sending uh, follow-up emails with all the schedule information for the next round, all the action items that came through, really trying to take all that organizational um, mental load off of DAT members so they could focus on the projects themselves. 
Okay, y'all, tell me if I've forgotten some steps. I, oh, I didn't talk about journaling. Somebody else talk about journaling. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> yeah, we also have some other good questions in the chat as well that I wanna make sure we spend some time on. So I think that that gave a pretty pretty thorough uh, explanation of what we do as facilitators. There's a, there's a lot to do as a facilitator. Um, the next question that I wanted to uh, touch on are, is how are change efforts sustained over the long term in a department, um, especially when the original team moves on? And I just want to touch base on this one back to the divination dat example that I gave, um, because that I know that particular dat you know sustained their efforts in a couple of ways. And so the first was that. Um, a couple of the DAT members actually took on the role uh, as internal facilitators. And so they trained with the external DAT facilitators for a semester um, in how to do all of those things that Sarah just described as, as the roles or responsibilities of a facilitator. And so they became confident in facilitating the DAT meetings um, once the external facilitators had left. So there was no need to hire any external facilitators. So that knowledge was retained within the department with at least two DAP members. Um, but furthermore, you know, uh, this particular, the divination DAP put several mechanisms into place to sustain the work that they were doing. So they continuously um, connected with the rest of the department about what they were doing so that others were fully aware of the progress they, they were making and the, and the changes that were going to be made, but also they put a couple of new roles into place to sustain this work um, and made it um, an explicit part of the department in terms of what the department does and values. And by making those structural and also policy changes, um, that helps to support and sustain the work of the DAT in the long term. Um, Joelle, are there any other DATs that you would like to comment on in terms of how they sustained their work in the long term? Well, I think potions was another example of, of, you know, creating a new structure, which was creating a new um, standing departmental committee on uh, uh, recruitment and retention and representation sorts of issues. Um, uh, and in fact, very early on, especially the, the faculty members in that group, because, you know, they're embedded in the politics and understand how that how that sort of thing works was were very focused on that goal of no we need to become not an ad hoc committee but a standing committee because those at least the way that the bylaws for that department were written those can only be um eliminated by a vote of the faculty so they were like okay if we get to that stage it's very unlikely that there will be a vote uh to get rid of the people who are worried about diversity in the department um uh and i mean as we all know like just having a committee also isn't enough, like there's plenty of departmental committees out there who um, are less than productive. Uh, and so I think that that they've also did a good job of, of doing a similar thing to what Courtney was talking about with divination, just maybe not as formal of like keeping up with the kinds of practices um, uh, and sort of ways of, you know, doing their work that we that we developed over that time of formally working with them. And I think we might have time for one more question. And I think Sarah, you might be able to speak best to this, um, is were there any patterns in the ways that DAT selected their undergraduate student members? Oh, yes. Um, so frequently the first thing that they would say when they'd already decided that they would take students, there was often discussions about taking students in the first place, graduate students versus undergraduates. But let's say they've decided. Then they would say, um, well, we better get some juniors and seniors because they're going to be the ones with the perspectives that really make sense. They, the, the younger ones won't have, won't make sense. Um, what we actually found was that um, sometimes they would call for applications and they would get a variety from, from first years to seniors to super seniors. And we found that sometimes they ended up taking a freshman. Um, and they all had great experiences. In fact, one of the DAT members who came on to a DAT two years ago as a first year is now leading as an internal facilitator in her junior year and doing a smashing job. So, um, 
So there was there was some conceptions that we did have to work with around taking different students. Usually though, DATS would create a set of criteria to evaluate the student applications and they were usually pretty thoughtful. They wanted to know what kinds of other leadership have they been doing? What kinds of ways have they been involved in the department? And those criteria were useful, I think, in finding um, students that would be committed to the dad. Okay, we have two more minutes, right? There's something I wanted to talk about because there's this, this thing that came up about um, uh, the difficulty of propagating best practices. And Joelle, it made me think about the active learning, learning by doing, initiative. Um, would you talk about how they assembled those panels and what that did in the department? This happened last summer, right? During COVID, I think. Oh, you mean the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that department, right, they had this, this initiative that they were, that, that, that they were trying to, to move along called learning by doing. And part of what the DATS work was, was even trying to figure out what that phrase meant, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. Um, one of the interesting things that that group ended up doing, um, especially once COVID hit and, you know, everybody's lives were sort of derailed, was to support the department in um, thinking about how how it should engage, you know, how, how it should make this transition to the sort of hybrid or online environment, um, given sort of the crises uh, uh, that were all around. Um, and yeah, I think they did it in a pretty nice way. They essentially um, uh, set up, I think, I think it might have been every few weeks over the course of that, that summer, right, that last summer, um, uh, some virtual discussion groups in Zoom. I think there, there was like a topic for each one uh, and they would assemble panels of students and, and faculty members to speak on, you know, particular topics um, related, to, related to the online transition. Um, and so it was a really nice way, I think, of supporting people in, in trying to think about like, well, how should we teach in this environment in a way that wasn't, um, very critical, like, you know, like, like, like sort of being like, this is the sort of stuff you have to do, but rather like, let's all come together as a group and talk about the situation we're in and what, what we can do to make this better for, for, for the students and for the faculty. Great. Well, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today. Um, if you could please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Courtney, Sarah, and Joelle for leading such a smashing discussion today. Also, thanks to our AAAS IUS team, uh, Iris Wagstaff, Thomas Begu, and Lauren Manier. We wanna hear what everyone thought of today's workshop. Please open the survey that is now in the chat and take just a minute to let us know what you thought. All feedback is anonymous and it's very helpful for shaping programs that bring value to you. As a reminder, recordings and materials can be found in the archives section of the Summer Labs page. And we hope that we will see all of you again this Tuesday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern for developing a new faculty model to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. See you then. Thank you.